Hello everyone and welcome to the Integrating Water and Coastal Dataset session in the fourth day of the GEO Virtual Symposium. My name is Andrea Siqueira. I am the International Relations Officer for Geoscience Australia in Europe. I'm based at the Food and Agriculture Organization in Rome, and I'm currently the Principal CEO's representative to the GEO Program Board. I will be your facilitator today, together with my colleagues, Carrie Sawyer and Cathy Fontaine. Kerry is the executive officer for the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites and also a senior international relations specialist for NOAA. Kerry has been involved with the GEO community since 2008. Kathy spent over 25 years at NASA working in a variety of different areas including data policy, spacecraft system trade studies, as well as Earth observation projects and programs. Cathy is currently Senior Research Scientist and Adjunct Professor at the Rizenla Polytechnic Institute. And also, Cathy is a member of the GEO Program Board and one of the main organizers of this symposium together with Kerry and other members of the program board who are part of the GEO Symposium Working Group. Um, first of all, I would like to welcome and to thank our presenters for their time and availability to participate in the first GEO Virtual Symposium. Dr. Leah Segi from NOAA, Dr. Stephen Grant from University of, of Wisconsin-Madison, Dr. Steven Sega from Geoscience Australia and Dr. Amos Kabuda from the University of Energy and Natural Resources. I would like also to welcome our participants from around the globe. And uh, we do appreciate that for some of you, Australia and Asia in particular, the time is not ideal. So welcome and thanks for your participation again. Also, I would like to acknowledge the fantastic work from the GEO Secretariat, which made this event possible. In particular, Wembo and Rick, who have been working day and night to guarantee the success of this symposium. Thank you. So, um, let me briefly introduce the session objective and outline. The Integrating Water in Coastal Dataset session aims to highlight the integration and applicability of Earth observation data combined with in-situ data for water and coastal applications, including the demonstration of tangible examples on how it has been utilized by GEO initiatives. So we are going to have four presentations. And at the end of the presentations, we will have a live discussion. Um, and I would like to encourage participants to use Slido if you would like to ask questions. The presenters will have the opportunity to answer to your questions at the end of this session during the live discussion. The Slido code to use is hashtag geo. Please also make sure to select the session number 11 from the top left of your Slido application, which is our session uh, number. Um, you will be able to post questions during the session and within 48 hours after the session is over. In case the presenters do not have enough time to answer your questions at the live uh, session, live discussion, the panel will do their best to answer the questions in writing within a week time. And um, also you can follow us on Twitter and you can see, um, you can see the codes in, uh, in, this, in this slide. So um, now I like to, to introduce our first speaker. Um, Dr. Leah Segi from NOAA. Leah plays a key role supporting the Geo Blue Planet Initiative Secretariat. Um, her current work involves the creation of information hubs 
to support networks in their use of Earth observation data in the global monitoring, mitigation, and management of marine pollution, disaster risk, and fisheries. So, um, welcome, Lia. Um, so now we can play the video. Thank you. Hello, my name is Leah Mupasigi, and I'm a policy fellow with GeoBlue Planet. The ocean connects us all, whether or not we live by it. It feeds us, supports our economies, we use it for recreation, and it has a big impact on our weather and our livelihoods. The more we understand about our ocean, the more we realize we need policies and management strategies for the resilience and sustainability of our planet. GEO's three engagement priorities, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and the Paris Climate Agreement, all depend on ocean and coastal information for implementation. The Sendai Framework seeks to reduce disaster risk through understanding vulnerabilities and enhancing disaster preparedness. For the 40% of the world's population that lives near the coast, there's a demand for ocean and coastal observations to implement the Sendai Framework for disasters such as coastal flooding, like in Indonesia seen here. We need these observations for the development of multi-hazard early warning systems, disaster risk information, and assessments. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development are a set of global goals centered around the sustainability and health for communities and ecosystems. 17 are related to the ocean, and one of them, Sustainable Development Goal 14, or SDG 14, is explicitly for the conservation and sustainable use of oceans, seas, and marine resources. Ocean and coastal observations play a key role in monitoring the ocean-related targets and with helping nations make informed decisions to achieve these sustainability goals. This leads me to the work of the GEO Blue Planet Initiative, which is the ocean and coastal initiative of GEO, linking ocean and coastal information with society. We work in 10 thematic areas represented in the image here, and for today's talk, I will focus on two of them. First is our work on disaster warning and mitigation as it relates to the Sendai framework, and second is our work on water quality as it relates to SDG 14, life below water. For disaster warning and mitigation, our focus is on low-lying islands with coral reefs that experience wave-driven flooding. These flood events could strike with no warning, even on windless, sunny days. Historically, this occurred every 20 to 30 years, but sea level rise will exacerbate the damage of wave-driven flood events on infrastructure, freshwater supplies, agriculture, and critical habitats. The image on the left is from Kiribati, and the, image on the, the two images on the right are from the Marshall Islands. And these illustrate the need for forecasting tools to protect the lives and livelihoods of coastal communities. There are challenges when it comes to forecasts for reef line coasts. First, while there are forecast tools for sandy shorelines, they don't accurately predict wave flooding on reef line coasts, leaving communities without proper forecasting tools. Second, the few models that do exist are expensive, and third, they require large amounts of computing power. We hope to address these challenges with WaveForce, which stands for Wave Driven Flood Forecasting on Reef Line Coast Early Warning System. This is a collaboration with NOAA, USGS, Deltaris, DSIRO, and other partners. WaveForce will be developed for all coral reef line coasts throughout the world and will provide coastal flood forecasts seven and a half days in advance. Every three hours, it'll be updated every six hours and given at intervals of 200 meters. The WaveForce system consists of three components, which are visualized here. First, altimeter satellites and models provide wave height and sea surface elevation forecast. These two models, along with bathymetry, are inputs for a flood model. WaveForce then produces a forecast based on every wave height, sea surface elevation, and bathymetry combination. Since this output is a simple lookup table, it can be retrieved using a PC. This system can be used for both 
Forecast and Hindcast, which are both important for combining local knowledge and technology to support resilient coastal communities. Integration of satellite-derived wave height and bathymetry will be supported by the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites, Coastal Observation and Application Study Team, also known as CIOS Coast. We plan to engage with users and stakeholders to co-design products that are fit for purpose. We'll now focus on our work relating to the UN SDG 14.1, which seeks to prevent and significantly reduce marine pollution of all kinds by 2025. The two indicators that we work on are 14.1.1 A and B, which focus on anthropogenic nutrient inputs and marine litter, respectively. We worked with, in collaboration with UN Environment and GEO AquaWatch to develop the methodology for the index of coastal eutrophication. For marine litter, GeoBlue Planet has hosted a series of workshops funded by the IEEE Oceanic Engineering Society. And we have drafted a white paper outlining a concept for a global platform for monitoring marine litter and informing action at request of the UN Environment Program. For context, eutrophication is a process by which nutrient inputs into the coastal system cause excessive growth of marine plants, algae, and phytoplankton. You could see the red algae explosion on the right. These nutrients come from land-based sources, and in particular, nitrogen and phosphorus, from agricultural fertilizers, livestock waste, and detergents in domestic wastewater. As many countries do not have in situ nutrient data to assess eutrophication, we have worked with the UN environment to support the development of sub-indicators related to chlorophyll A, which is a common indicator for eutrophication. Here's the methodology for the index of coastal, coastal eutrophication. It is split into three levels, level one for global, level two for national, and level three for supplementary indicators. This talk will highlight our work on level one indicators, mainly the chlorophyll A deviations. Chlorophyll A deviations rely on remote sensing to determine the percentage of coastal zone with chlorophyll A deviations and intra-annual coastal zone chlorophyll A anomalies. For this first one, it uses an ESA ocean color CCI product seen here on the right. This is led by the Plymouth Marine Lab, and they use ocean color imagery from CWIFS, MODIS, Maris, and VIRUS from 1997 to 2019 to produce a merged chlorophyll A product. To determine the percentage of coastal zone with chlorophyll A deviations, we use chlorophyll A derived from the ocean color CCI product. So let's say you are interested in deviations in 2018. Chlorophyll A is generated for each individual pixel within a country's coastal zone for the reporting year. This is done monthly with a four kilometer resolution. For generation of a baseline, results are averaged by month between 2000 and 2004. We then use these values to calculate a percentage of coastal zone with chlorophyll A deviations seen here, which is the average monthly pixel chlorophyll A from the baseline minus that from the reporting year divided by the baseline multiplied by 100. We use these data to generate a chlorophyll A dashboard seen here. We are working with ESRI to produce statistics and develop visualization tools for UN countries to identify potential eutrophication hotspots within their coastal zones. The goal is to show trends in chlorophyll A and to help inform in situ collection of nutrient data. Ultimately, we want to be able to link eutrophication hotspots with additional information, such as river inputs and land use changes. We are currently brainstorming ideas of how to use machine learning to integrate these different data sets. For intra-annual coastal zone chlorophyll A anomalies, we use NOAA VIRS chlorophyll anomaly products that are calculated using a running 61-day chlorophyll A median. We could first calculate the relative frequency of chlorophyll A anomalies by dividing the number of days with a high anomaly by the number of days with valid observations. The cumulative relative frequency is calculated similarly, and it's based on the range of values associated with each level of anomaly 
So from no anomaly, moderate, high, to extreme. The cumulative relative frequency could be used as a visualization tool to show anomaly occurrences at a given location. Lastly is our work on marine litter, a global issue spanning from land, to the depths of the ocean, and even on the most remote islands. We address this through a white paper titled, A Global Platform for Monitoring Marine Litter and Informing Action. The white paper covers six topics. First, it provides a review of existing and developing monitoring technologies, from human observations to remote sensing of floating plastic seen here. And this image is from Dr. Laura Bierman et al, 2020. The white paper also provides review of existing marine litter databases and major published data sets, such as the Global Ghost Gear Initiative data portal seen here. It includes SDG indicators and other types of indicators, a review on monitoring the, the plastics value chain through a life cycle approach, and we identify existing and developing global platforms to share data. With all these data and technologies that may not be interoperable, this presents an opportunity to leverage advances in machine learning and AI to harness these different sources and tools to combat marine litter. So lastly, UN Environment and IBM are developing a multi-stakeholder platform that will capture and integrate various elements of marine litter that could be used by anyone, from the general public to scientists to decision makers. The current focus is establishing national baselines for marine litter for countries to understand their largest sources of litter and to measure policy effectiveness. Along with our work in support of UN and SDGs, Geoplug Planet also provides networking and coordination support to connect the marine litter community. We also work with stakeholders at global, regional, and local scales to identify data and information gaps and to help identify best practices in marine litter related to ocean observations to inform policy and measure their effects. I also want to highlight work done by a steering committee member, Eric Chassonet and his colleagues on modeling the movement of marine plastic waste, which is another project funded by the UN Environment. This project aimed to determine where plastic waste went once it was released into the ocean and where plastic waste on coast come from. To do so, they use particle seeding that realistically represents the input of mismanaged waste into the ocean. It was then combined with a high resolution global ocean circulation and wind data, as well as a state-of-the-art Lagrangian analysis tool called Ocean Parcels. The web interface of the model is seen here. And the colorful lines represent plastic waste movement from 2010 to 2014. The models show that about a quarter of marine plastic waste released into the ocean stays in the ocean, whereas three quarters of it ends up on the beach. The waste that remains in the ocean accumulated primarily in the subtropical gyres, Mediterranean Sea, and in the Northern Indian Ocean, especially in the Bay of Bengal. And this is consistent with anecdotal and published observations. You can check out the model at the address seen below. The integration of ocean and coastal data is key to achieving the global policy frameworks addressed in this talk. These global policies illustrate the need for the integration of Earth observations from land to sea to inform policy and management solutions. GEO is in a great position to use upcoming UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development to make progress on global policy frameworks and inform regional and national policies and management strategies. GEO's cross-cutting nature provides the opportunity to support the decade by integrating data across the land and sea interface and harness its global partnerships, pursue concrete actions, and use Earth observations in service to society. Management and policy decisions related to the successful implementation of the Sendai framework and the UN 2030 agenda will continue to depend on Earth observations, uh, but the science is not enough. We also need to integrate knowledge of socioeconomic systems and the human dimensions that influence how we are impacted by and how we impact the ocean. We invite you to continue the conversation on integrating water and coastal data sets at the fifth GeoBlue Planet Symposium in South Africa in 2021. Thank you.
Thank you, Leah, for your outstanding presentation on the GeoBlue Planet Initiative, which included the work done on disaster warning and mitigation and water quality, and um, in particular, marine litter and coastal eutrophication. And um, also, it was very interesting to see uh, in your presentation that GeoBlue Planet is hoping to address the challenge to forecast flood events to support coastal communities using um, the Wave 4 system and how GeoBlue Planet is planning to engage with users and stakeholders to co-design products that are fit for purpose. So thank you again uh, for your presentation. And um, now I would like to move to our next speaker. Um, I would like to invite Dr. Stephen Grab, who is a research scientist at the University of Wisconsin Medicine, Space Science and Engineering. Stephen is well known among the GEO community as uh, he is the current director for GEO AquaWatch, which is one of the key GEO water quality initiatives in the GEO work program. So, um, and uh, Stephen is also part of the editorial board of the Journal of Remote Sensing. So, I would like to welcome uh, you, Steve. Thank you. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, as the case may be. My name is Steve Greb, and I'm the director of Geo AquaWatch, the Water Quality Initiative. I want to start by thanking the organizers and the GeoSec office for the opportunity to speak to you today. What I want to share with you today are some of the activities that AquaWatch is involved with, with respect to ensuring confidence in, of Earth observation data in products. So I'm not going to talk about AquaWatch per se. Suffice to say that AquaWatch has five components. Um, all along the, the data flow, and the two that we're most interested in are the observations and data and products and information that we're going to be talking about today. Each of these five circles that are on this, this diagram have uh, working groups that are, that are supporting these activities. So, just a little context for the presentation. We all know that there's a lot of Earth imagery being generated um, every day and that a lot of it is, is underutilized. And we're, we're seeing more and more that um, particularly satellite Earth observations can have a significant impact on the framing and the driving and driving changes in policies and in management practices. Um, I would also say that what we're talking about here today is applicable to other GEO initiatives. And I see this as foundational work in support of GEO strategic plan. And though I, I might touch on the engagement priorities um, and, and probably won't focus on them too much, but this is important, um, again, background or foundational work, which will support the engagement priorities. I also want to recognize the principles that have previously been described by the quality assurance for Earth observations that uh, we're following. Um, and I think one of the important take home messages here is we need to build trust and success stories with the end user community. In a recent paper by Schaefer et al., um, in which they surveyed a number of water quality managers, um, as in the, the box here, it says almost unanimously, interviewees wanted assurance that the satellite product could be validated and include reported accuracy or error estimates for their particular water bodies. And that they agree that if a product was proved to provide an accurate measure of their particular water body of interest, they would be open to using these products for monitoring, research, and assessment. So I, the slide that I'm on the I'm displaying here now, it, these are six um, platforms or data sources, if you will, that you can find on the web right now, which uh, um, are a source of water quality data, um, either the, the UNESCO water quality portal, um, NOAA's ocean color site, or the Copernicus Land Global Land Service, which has a, a lake water quality tab there. Um, and, and a number of the data cube efforts that are going on. So they're all producing 
water quality data that can that can be accessed. Some of the issues are that these these different approaches or different entities use different could use different sensors, different time periods, different product processing, which is really important, have different degrees of validation, and some are open source, some are proprietary. The bottom line is there could be conflicting results from different these different products for the same time and location. Hence the concern about uh, trust from the end user. So what is AquaWatch doing to help strengthen the confidence in Earth observation water quality data sets? So three things that, that we're currently working on that I'd want to touch on today. One is working on aquatic analysis ready data. Uh, second is a building of global data sets. And third is a coordination of a global validation effort. All these play a key role in the development of the Knowledge Hub, um, which is really one of our primary focuses. And they contribute to the GIS data management principles um, in the need for common standards and interoperability arrangements. So all this work, um, I'm going to talk first about the aquatic analysis ready data. And this work is being done collaboratively with CIOS um, and some of the entities within CIOS, namely the Working Group on Information Systems and Services, the Land Surface Imaging Virtual Constellation, and the Working Group on Calibration and Validation. And you can see all three of these in their goal statements um, have language that um, that are in support of the group on Earth observations. And uh, they have, it, it's been a great uh, experience working with them. So what is analysis-ready data? CS defines it as satellite data that has been processed to a minimum set of requirements and organized into a form that allows immediate analysis with a minimum of additional user effort and interoperability, both through time and with other data sets. And that, that's an important definition. So CS has been involved in, in three, um, you know, should we say other parameters that they're, they've completed now, um, what they call their product family specifications. And this, this would be the, the land surface reflectance, surface temperature, and normalized backscatter. And then now they're working on two other additional parameters. The second of which is the aquatic reflectance, which is what our interest is here. Aquatic reflectance, um, you could say, is our currency, is, is kind of our, our starting point in which we use reflectance to build our, our algorithms or models, which relate the, the satellite signal to a, a parameter of, of interest, say the concentration of chlorophyll. The third point is here is this ARD is no longer a desire of the global users, but is now becoming a requirement and an expectation. So why do we need ARD? It increases the use and impact of satellite data and removes the data preparation burden for less experienced data users. So again, this plays an important role when we think about the Knowledge Hub. And it promotes data quality and consistency through defined specifications, these product family specifications I talked about. And maybe more importantly, it enables improved interoperability due to, due to consistent specifications across different data sets in time. Why do we need an aquatic specific ARD? Well, of course, we all know there's been an increased interest in water quality. Uh, from space such as SDG 6.6.1. And uh, currently, many users are trying to apply water quality algorithms to the land surface products. And this isn't an accurate proce process. The water radiant signal is much smaller than the land signal. And, it, it, and because of that, there's special atmospheric, atmospheric correction and things like adjacency effect. Uh, surface corrections that must be adjusted specifically for water targets. And this aquatic ARD product for Landsat and Sentinel-2 is going to help the user community and improve the science products. So what is AquaWatch doing with respect to ARD? So we held a global community discussion on May 20th, just a few weeks ago, um, 
Coming out of that, we've, we're forming an aquatic ARD working group, and we're going to hold the, the next meeting in early July. <clears throat> Things we're going to talk about are developing a community consensus on the ARD aquatic product family specifications, the PFS as they call it, and what are the community needs. The other thing we're going to talk about is uh, essential climate variables. Um, so th this is from GCOS, and these are important in understanding our changing climate and the cycling of carbon and the impact on water bodies. Um, thirdly, the use of the new CIOS Coast Study Team as a vehicle to advance these products. Um, and I'm just going to divert for one minute and talk about CS Coastal Observations and Applications uh, Study Team, which is the ac what the acronym COAST stands for. So the CS Coast is this coastal strategy for CS and helps facilitate engagement with key stakeholders. It's going to bring together both um, bring together and integrate a wide array of both land and water products to help us understand the interactions and dynamics at this important uh, interface. And we're going to do this by building pilots uh, in, at locations around the globe. Uh, ARD is going to play an important role in, in this effort. So this is an exciting new effort, which is just starting up, and I'm sure you're going to hear more about it. Uh, the, the second thing that, um, that AquaWatch is involved with with respect um, to ensuring quality data, we're going to compile global data sets, um, both in situ and satellite remote sense data. Um, AquaWatch has been involved with, again, compiling a data inventory. And we're, we're going to put this into the Real Earth Portal, which is housed here at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And this will also be embedded seamlessly into the AquaWatch website and linked to GEOS. And it's going to bring together data of varying file formats, naming conventions and columns, and transforming it into one cohesive data set. So we can compare um, these data sets as um, the issue that I, I previously had brought up. So it'll bring together grab samples, buoy data, satellite products as example. Um, and it also have visual displays, um, be able to produce time series and scroll across to look at sources for data comparison. And this is going to be updated hourly. We're hoping to start this work um, by the 1st of July of this year. And the last thing we're doing um, that we're excited about is um, we're going to hold a validation workshop. We applied for a NASA grant uh, at, in December of, of this past year. Um, it was awarded this spring. Um, due to the COVID uh, crisis, we're unable to hold the, um, the, the workshop, which is, is slated to, to be held here in Madison, Wisconsin. So the, the workshop itself is being delayed till June of 2021. The goal of this workshop is to build a global scale validation network. And the workshop is going to cover a number of aspects related to validation. Uh, I'm not going to go through all these, but suffice to say that it, it is going to bring ex experts together from both the remote sensing and the in-situ community. There's a number of workshop uh, objectives including looking at what, what are the current validation activities um, and identify gaps in the spatial coverage, look at uh, the state of the current in situ and lab optical measurements, as well as satellite measurements in terms of representativeness for coastal and inland waters, and, and also spend quite a bit of time on the current optical and water quality databases. Um, including the repository archive, the preservation, the providence, which is quite an important, critical, the stewardship, and the access to this data. And then finally, as I, I started to talk about uh, um, as part of our goal, we want to build global coordination through international partnerships for validation activities. So in summary, um, there's multiple streams of water quality data products. Um, generated on a daily basis. Um, there's multiple approaches and methods used to generate 
satellite Earth observation data, and they all have varying degrees of validation. And as we're seeing, there's critical quality assurance issues that need to be addressed for the end, for end user trust and successful uptake of these valuable data products. And finally, AquaWatch is providing an important platform and forum at this critical time to address these data quality needs. So I'll, I'll quit there. Um, this has our contact information. If you have uh, questions specific to these activities that I've, I've talked about and discussed today, feel free to reach out to me, or if you have general questions about AquaWatch or, or want to get involved. So thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for your very nice and informative presentation on the activities that GEO AquaWatch Initiative has been involved to ensure confidence in Earth's observation data and products. And um, I was very happy to see in your presentation that um, AquaWatch is working in collaboration with SEALS entities, LSI, VC, SEALS Working Group, Calvao, and Wiggis, and I am part of uh, LSI, VC, um, and that um, AquaWatch is working in collaboration to support the SEALS ARD initiatives, the SEALS Analysis Ready Data Initiative, and um, I would like to quote you um, that you, you, you said in your presentation, and I completely agree with what you said, that analysis-ready data is no longer a desire of global users, but it's now becoming a requirement and an expectation. So um, I would like to thank you again uh, for your presentation and your thoughts. So uh, before we move to the next presentation, um, I would like to remind participants that if you would like to ask questions, uh, please submit them using Slido and use the code GEO. We are going to have a live discussion uh, session at the end of the presentations. And so the code uh, to use is GEO to submit your questions for our presenters uh, through Slido. Then I, I would like to, to introduce our third speaker for today's session, my colleague from Geoscience Australia, Dr. Steve Sega. Steve plays a key role leading the development of aquatic products to support the Australian government policies and decision making. Steve has over 10 years experience in the application and development of remote sensing algorithms in coastal, shallow water, and inland water environment. So welcome, Steve. This presentation is part of the Integrating Water and Coastal Dataset session. Um, I'm going to be presenting a, an Australian EO product that we're developing here um, called DEA Coastlines that looks at the history of coastal trains across Australia. My name is Stephen Sager. I lead the aquatic development team uh, within Digital Earth Australia. We develop a range of different products in the aquatic and marine space. Commonality is they all leverage the uh, rich archive of available, uh, publicly available EO data sources. So firstly, this is a collaborative project with a bunch of people in our group. Um, Robbie Bishop-Taylor uh, largely leads the technical component of this work, as myself, Rachel Nansen, who's our coastal geomorphologist, and also Leo Limburner. So a brief presentation outline, I'm going to talk a little bit about Digital Earth Australia in a, in a data cube context and what analysis ready data means, look at coastal regions and how they align with some of the geo priorities, then talk about some of the DEA coastal products that we've developed over the last couple of years and how we're looking at moving more to monitoring a dynamic coast. Then I'm going to introduce the product in question, which is DEA coastlines, look at the method and a few of our examples, and then talk about some future work we're, we're doing trying to link that to coastal change and to different kind of environmental drivers. So Digital Earth Australia really kicked off when the USGS released the uh, public available uh, Landsat data back in 2009. And this first prototype uh, was called the Australian Geoscience Data Cube, and this was a collaborative project within Australia. And this developed into the Open Data Cube initiative, and Digital Earth Australia is the government, Australian government implementation of the ODC. So we also support other global ODC initiatives, such as Digital Earth Africa, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Now the DA model, uh, really the crux of, of what we do is leveraging this deep continental scale of time series data. We do that on high performance computing facilities, either physical or in the cloud um, increasingly. And the important part about this is the use of standardized analysis ready data. So we, we standard um, process our data to surface reflectance, 
We have uh, quality controls like cloud masking and pixel quality, essentially looking to take away all of those variables out of Earth observation data, which present, prevents people to go through and analyze it. You can see in the animation on the right here as we sort of um, move into the Sentinel era, our aim is to have these different data so, uh, sources from different sensors like closely integrated so they can add value to environmental interpretation. We have this all on an analytical platform, which enables people to come to the data, write code, we deliver products, they can interact with those. So we really want to make break down these barriers for, for industry and people and government to get in and use this data. And relate to the geo initiatives that we're looking at here or the priorities. So globally, 40% of the world's population lives within 100 kilometres of the coast. And in Australia, this increases to about 85% of our population within about 50 k's of the coast. So I guess at this point, uh, it's worth saying, look, these products are Australia-centric. We developed them in Australia. But being on an ODC platform, um, we are looking to take them uh, internationally. So people should look at these in context, I guess. Now, 10% of the world's population live in coastal areas less than 10 metres above sea level, and even more in uh, developing island nations. In terms of these geo-engagement priorities, these places are in risk from climate change, they're much more susceptible to disaster impacts such as storm surge. So knowing more about the coastline in these areas is critical to understanding that risk and how we move forward with that. And these regions are under increased pressure from population growth and development. As part of the Geo Canberra Declaration, there was discussions around recognising the significantly increased risk of these island nations. And some of the data sets we're going to be looking at here are easily applicable to those kind of countries. Products we've already developed over the last couple of years, we developed a national intertidal digital elevation model called NIDA. This uses the uh, full 30 years of the Landsat archive across Australia. We developed an intertidal elevation model out of that, so essentially a DEM that takes care of that intersection between land and sea, that exposed intertidal surface that traditionally is really hard to, to survey uh, using traditional methods. And this uh, product has managed to um, increase the interface, uh, to improve that interface. So for things like inundation modelling, you have a, more, a much better transition from land through to sea. We also have a couple of image products, which we call the high and low tide composite products. Uh, and essentially, these are composites made at high and low tide, which give a cloud and noise-free visualisation of the coastline across Australia at these sort of different environmental epochs, which are really important for habitat modelling, habitat monitoring and mapping. But those are static products, and we have a change in coastline, so we need a dynamic product. And this has been in the news a lot in Australia recently. We've had some areas which are already subject to erosion, and this has been exacerbated by, by big storm events um, near infrastructure, near roads and homes. We've also had environmental impacts from things like mangrove dieback, where this uh, can exacerbate erosion. We need methods that can monitor a, a dynamic coast. And even in a simple form for estuaries, like you can see in the graphic on the right here, these are constantly changing. And for environmental managers of estuary health and things like this, we need an efficient way to be able to monitor these through time and ongoing. So when we talk of applying this kind of method to a continent the size of Australia, we talk about an issue of scale. Um, and this is both from a temporal scale. We want to be able to leverage this time series and from a temporal perspective. We want to be able to do things at a continental scale. Australia is a big country. And we want to make use of this public EO data. But often that means we're making a sacrifice in terms of spatial resolution. And you can see at the bottom left here, you can see high resolution data from somewhere like a private satellite like Worldview, and the amount of detail we lose when we move to these public good satellites. And sometimes this isn't going to be enough to pick up those fine scale changes in the coast. So we developed a subpixel method, which is able to drive shoreline subpixel from Landsat uh, 30 meter data. And on the panels on the right here, you can see the orange line, which represents a shoreline which we would drive from standard Landsat if we were to stick with the pixel based method. The blue line is our subpixel derived shoreline, and it uh, correlates very well with a, a high resolution shoreline, so we're quite confident we had something in this approach. We did some prototype testing. Um, there was a, a location in Australia called Narrabeen Beach in Sydney, and that's had an extensive monitoring campaign that you don't often get for the last 30 odd years. And this is a beach that's neither eroding or accreting, there's just some natural variability going on. You can see from the panel in the middle there that our shorelines that we've derived, the 30 shorelines over 30 years, all fall within 30 metres, so one Landsat pixel. So we needed to know whether or not what we're picking up with this shoreline change is actually some, you know, is, is real life or whether it's just something from our modelling. And compared to the validation data we have at Narrabeen, you can see we, we've gotten quite good results and we were, we were quite surprised when these came out of the process. So the yellow section you can see running through the middle of this 
graph is actually the width of a Landsat pixel. And you can see that we're quite effectively picking up change sub-pixel that correlates with this validation data. So this gave us the, the impetus to move forward to a national product. I'll just quickly step through how we scaled that up. So a lot of our work um, in DEA or in the coastline space look, works with tidal attribution. So this is using the Oregon State Tidal Model. So the first thing we do, we've gone through and we've attributed every pixel um, through time and space. So for Australia, through 30 years of Landsat data, that's a lot of pixels with a tidal height attribution. So what was the tidal height when this pixel was acquired? And you can see that with the, the yellow dots down there on the tidal, um, the tidal uh, graph down the bottom. After that, we've gone and masked out pixels, which are within 25, beyond 25% of um, the, the tidal range that we've seen, so the extremes. What that means is we've managed to isolate, taking out the tidal effects from this data. So all the data we'll be looking at through the country is within that range of mean sea level, and we've tried to isolate those tidal effects. We then generate yearly composites using a water index, and we can apply the sub-pixel methodology to, to these yearly comp composites to extract our uh, mean sea level annual shorelines, which is the top right image you can see. Once we have those shorelines, we can then start looking at trends and rates of erosion and accretion. You can see erosion in the red, and you can see accretion in the blue, which corresponds obviously to the shorelines, and we can start looking at the different behaviours around the, around the country. These products, uh, we deliver them with a scale dependent um, dependency, so that we can look at different features at different scales. So at a national scale, we can start looking at summary trends of erosion, which is red and blue accretion again. As we zoom in a bit closer, you can start seeing more statistics around the, the rates of erosion and accretion. Zoom in even more, we start to see the trends in shorelines running across the 30 years from purple through to yellow. As we get very much closer into the data set, you can start seeing the yearly attribution of these shorelines. Now, obviously, all these individual data sets can be downloaded by a user as well as in web services to be analysed for their purposes. So just to look at a couple of the things that we've seen in the data sets as, as we've been um, moving toward publishing. Uh, Western Australian Department of Transport recently released a hotspots um, report looking at coastal erosion across the state. One of those areas that they identified was a place called Port Beach, which is near Perth, Australia. And you can see Port Beach has um, got an erosion almost about two metres per year. And it's very close to infrastructure and is being exacerbated by these big climate events. You can also see to the southwest of the beach is that the port has actually had land reclaimed in sort of stages as you move through time. There's a clear correlation with that and the erosion effects we're seeing. And we've been able to actually map our erosion um, hotspots through our method. And we're comparing them to the um, engineering uh, based uh, analysis that the, the Department of Transport did. We've got a very close correlation with the hotspot they had identified. We can also capture general geomorphic change. So this is an island of the North Great Barrier Reef, and we can actually see it's um, migrating north at almost two metres per year, and this has implications for, for charting. It has implications for developing island nations when you want to monitor shorelines at this scale. On the right here, you can see the entrance to Moreton Bay, which is near Brisbane, Australia. And you can see over 30 years, the sand spits and, and, the, and Swan Bay to the north has actually changed shape uh, significantly to the, to the point where it's almost unrecognisable from, from the geomorphic shape it was 30 years ago. And a good example of anthropogenic change, both as uh, intervention by humans being the source of the problem and also whether or not we can monitor the effectiveness of any actions, remedial actions, is on the New South Wales-Queensland border um, near the Tweed River. So back in the 60s, there were a couple of uh, breakwaters installed around the mouth of the Tweed River. And this reduced the sediment supply of the sand coming up from the south and replenishing those northern beaches. Now, those northern beaches are part of the Gold Coast in Australia, which is an iconic beach location, so losing those beaches wasn't an option. So in the 1990s, there was a replenishment program put in to pump sand from the southern beaches through to the north. And you can see quite clearly here, we've been able to see this clear effect of the erosion of those southern beaches that that sand is pumped through and the accretion and the replenishment of the beaches to the north. Now we also reached out to a range of different government, state government and local government sources to get validation data and they've um, kindly supplied that to us in multiple formats. And on the right there, we've gone back to our old favourite at the start for, for Narrabeen Beach to see how our, our full model um, correlates, to the, correlates to the validation data and we're quite happy with the results we're getting through time. And this is another example where, where we've got good correlation results from the validation data. This is at an erosion hotspot um, called Stockton Beach in New South Wales. This has had erosion going on for many years and there's mitigation efforts in place and a monitoring campaign, hence all the validation data. 
And then three things of note you can see in the left panel up north of the beach, you've got a rock wall that was built, um, which has actually started to mitigate against that early erosion, which was happening in the late 90s. Down south, you can actually see that the erosion is continuing in quite a linear fashion, almost at the rate of one metre per year. And given the, this is very close to a, um, a caravan park, you can see down there too. And given what we're seeing with the validation data and our product, we're quite confident that what we're seeing is, is, is accurate. Another thing this uh, data has the potential to do is to help sort of supplement the investment that's being made by state governments in these type of monitoring programs. So Western Australia, Department of Transport again, has been doing aerial photograph uh, photogrammetry surveys for many years, trying you know capture this kind of coastal change. Obviously that's expensive, so they do it once every five years or so. By doing a yearly shoreline, we can actually supplement that, and we can start to help provide a clearer picture of these different rates of change, whether the changes between years are gradual or they're event-based, and we can really become a complementary data set um, alongside the, what they're doing from aerial photography. And what we're moving into into the future is now trying to see whether or not we can examine different kind of climate drivers in this context. So beach er erosion across the Pacific Ocean is driven by ENSO, um, the Southern Oscillation Index, which affects La Nina and El Nino, has different effects on beaches, and these events are forecast to become much more extreme and frequent in, in the future. So what we want to see is if there's correlations with the different types of erosion and accretion patterns we see in our beaches based on these different kind of climate drivers, which if they're happening more often, might start to enable us to learn what might happen in our beaches, especially on the eastern coast in moving into the future. So in summary, uh, DA Coastlines, the continental scale product in Australia, we're providing annual mean sea level shorelines and coastal change metrics for the past 30 years. We're open to release this as a product by the end of 2020. Uh, this will be an open source product. Uh, we're thinking the code will also be available. And in that time before release, we're really looking to focus on stakeholder feedback, establish this feedback loop of validation and engagement at the state and local level, because really these are the people that are at the coal face of having to deal with these problems. So we need the product to be something that can help them. And then we're also aiming as one of our priorities to transfer the method, the method internationally, and that's how I guess this ties into some of these geo activities. This is through initiatives such as DA Africa, and we're also involved with the newly established Sea Coast program, so looking to see if we can take this time and methodology and establish it somewhere else, perhaps where we've got an ODC implementation. That's it for me. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, people can shoot me an email if they want to be kept up to date with the release schedule of the product, um, and I'll be taking questions in the session after this. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, for your exciting presentation on the Digital Earth Africa coastal methods and products, and uh, the demonstration on how these products are being used in Australia. Also, um, it's quite nice to see how Geoscience Australia is looking at transferring these successful uh, stories, um, this knowledge, to the international community through geo-community activities such as Digital Earth Africa and the, the Seals Coast. Um, thank you again for, for your presentation. So now um, I would like to introduce our last speaker for today's session. Um, Dr. Amos Kobada from the University of Energy and Natural Resources. Amos is a well-known and a very active member of the GEO community. In particular, um, in the GEO AquaWatch and the GEO Land Degradation Neutrality Initiatives. Amos is also the principal Ghana representative to the GEO Program Board. So uh, welcome, um, Amos. The chair of the session, colleagues, presenters, ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to present on the waters and coasts of Africa. This presentation, I hope, will demonstrate the value addition of using air observations for informing and helping policymakers across Africa on the need to work hard in transforming communities from poor communities into sustainable communities. So the case studies will span from national, regional, and international efforts. I am Amos Kaboba from Ghana, and I'm working with the University of Energy and Natural Resources. I am a senior lecturer of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, and has been involved in geo activities since 2010. Currently, I am a member of the program board and co-chair for the geo 
LDN initiative. Before I proceed with my presentation, I want to use this chance to acknowledge the enormous contributions from, first of all, the Afri Geo Secretariat, that is currently the regional center for mapping of resources for development, the South African National Space Agency, SANSA, and the CSIR also of South Africa, the GMS for Africa, the Geo Blue Planet, the several national agencies and members of AFRIGEO, and lastly, the Digital Earth Africa, that is one of the, the high spotlights for, for the African continent in the demonstration of the use of air observations now and in the near future. So to begin with, I, as you can see in this slide, it has become very, very important for us to realize the importance of the demonstration of air observations and satellite images for supporting daily lives. Like in the case of this slide, we are talking about flooding and flooding cuts across the whole of Africa. Several countries experience flooding on annual, annual, uh, annual scales. And therefore, it is important that we try to think about case studies that will demonstrate this. In the case of Kenya, you can see that some villages are flooded here. And of course, in most communities across Africa, most of these people depend on farming as a way of livelihood. And they usually spend quite a lot of income trying to invest into their farms. So if the farms get flooded, then of course, the issues of food insecurity comes in. So this is a very important case. And I, I, and from what you've done is trying to use uh, chief satellite data and uh, which is a good product as it, it also links up with institute data measurements. It also proves the point that we, in a way, if we want to understand flooding, that we, we have to improve our institute measurements in order to better calibrate and improve our satellite measurements so that in the end we have reliable data that we can better use for our flooding purposes. So as in the case of this map, you can see some of the areas that are prone to this particular flooding as was, has been demonstrated. This is zero in using the high resolution imagery supported by the Google engine. And uh, this is really good and a good example. And uh, I hope that other African countries could learn from Kenya and do similar things for other parts of Africa. Now, this is another case from South Africa, uh, the importance of coastal information management system. There is, is very important we start to consider our coastal management uh, as a lot happens in our oceans across Africa. Uh, in terms of uh, transport, of uh, goods and services, and in terms of fishing, in terms of even maintaining the ocean ecosystems, that is very important. And this example is from South Africa demonstrating the need to really closely monitor, for example, day and night about issues uh, about ships, oil spills, and all the issues of governance when it comes to the oceans and coast of South Africa. As can be seen, uh, they have an online tool that is continuously uh, monitoring the, the number of ships that are moving on their, in their oceans. And as a result, they are able to really reliably tell which ships are legal and which ships are illegal. And I think this is very, very important trying to monitor illegality and trying to control and bring in some governance that will help in better revenue collection. So as is demonstrated here, it means that with air observations, we can better understand our oceans and we can better know what to do to ensure that uh, incomes or revenues are not lost as a result of some illegality. This example uh, is further shown in the, from a national example that uh, CSIR submitted a grant to the GMS for Africa and uh, the grant was, uh, was awarded. So several countries now coming together in the southern region to try to see how they could expand the good example from South Africa to the other countries. And 
the aim for this uh, was to first of all ensure that our communities, our grassroots, get benefit for the information we get. And I think this is what GEO, should, GEO stands for, trying to ensure that whatever we do at the top level, it also benefits the community. And this is demonstrated by this example. So small scale fishing communities are able to access via mobile application uh activities that are happening uh, in their oceans and as a result they are able to know what really to do it also means that uh, community leaders also in the aquaculture and what have you can use this application to better improve what they need to do and of course it also helps uh, district offices or institutions that are also working in site communities too, also through this application, are able to understand what to do. So this is really also proving the, the vital information for air observations in this manner. Now, again, the industries are important. Uh, the commercial sector is key because uh, they have to take this up and further develop it. And, and they are also key in the overall chain. And uh, again, this collaboration helped in Providing uh, regional really optimized for some of and focus and products that are good for monitor operations. So it, in a way, in broad sense, it helps the industries to improve their income or to increase their revenue at the end of the day. Now, in a nutshell, uh, it also helps governments in the various countries to better understand the ocean governance and how they can further use this ocean governance, transparency ocean governance, in trying to ensure that they can alleviate poverty in the various uh, countries. So as we can see in this example, this is uh, starting from South Africa, taking the initiative, expanding it further to the Southern African countries. And uh, it, it proves that uh, air observation is really crucial, helping the communities, helping the industries, and at the end of the day, helping the government. And I think this is really a very good example that could be taken up by the rest of the continent or other developing countries that may not have this uh, potential already. Now, Digital Air Africa. Uh, Digital Air Africa has come and is, is one of the big, uh, big, big uh, future for Africa, uh, building of data cubes. And uh, this is an initial demonstration of how Digital Air Africa is crucial for the continent. It started with five countries with the African Regional Data Cube. And now with the Digital Air Africa, the, the efforts will be uh, further scaled up. So this is a demonstration of the water observation from space algorithm, which was implemented based on the Landsat and also now Sentinel over the large data archive. And I want to say that uh, this work is very important uh, as uh, this is an example which is shown here, but I, I quite remember that we used the same algorithm for Ghana and he was able to demonstrate areas of uh, water pollution and, and all other stuff. I mean, because once you have uh, a water body, they are, depending on how the puzzle counts are done, then you are able to tell what is really happening. And this was very vital for our government in trying to find uh, to to look at the impacts of illegal mining on uh, pollution of our water bodies. So I think uh, Digital Health Africa will further help to uh, develop more case studies that will inform our African governments to, to see where to really invest their money and ensuring that uh, at the end of the day, uh, communities uh, get what they want at the end of the day. So this is just a case of Tanzania, and as I mentioned before, there was also a case of Ghana, which was clearly demonstrated by the Digital Health Africa. This is another by the Geo, Geo Blue Planet, an initiative uh, that occurs across several countries. This is just a case of uh, giving an example of how uh, illegal, unregulated uh, kind of fishing it can cause huge losses, huge losses, huge uh, revenue. And like in the West African region alone, the region uh, loses almost 7.15 uh, million uh, billion a year. And of course, uh, of course, what is also lost is that employment people lose their jobs. And uh, 
and this is quite uh, this is really not good so the preliminary results uh, which is just shown in this graph uh, is saying that the sea level surface temperature uh, changes in one way or the other is 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 affecting the waters of Ghana and as this is affecting of course is also affecting the phytoplankton zooplankton and all this in one way or the other affect the, your fish stocks so it is important that we use the air observation to further understand this uh, so that we can be able to know what to do at what time and these are map showing examples of tracking of fishing vessels and trying to show which ones are legal, which ones are illegal, and also helps with relevant stakeholders to, to understand what they need to do uh, at the end of the day. Now, the, the, the importance of uh, ocean monitoring is also key, like fishermen, especially in the West Africa, they need usually to locate fish, to navigate, to focus weather has always been a challenge, and through the, uh, the GMS for Africa, I mean, in Ghana, it was demonstrated that through it was possible to provide uh, early warning systems uh, for, for the fishermen. And uh, with, with a simple tool like a phone, then the, farm, the fishermen are able to tell whether uh, they send a text message. And from the text message, they are able to tell whether it's calm, the weather is going to become rough or dangerous. And as a result, they can better plan their fishing activities. I, it's, I'm reliably informed that this Bangladesh is already interested in uh, making use of this uh, SMS alert uh, uh, protocol. And the uh, University of Ghana is closely working with some relevant organization in Bangladesh to ensure that this technology transfer is, is achieved. And I think this is what GEO is all about. And um, a good example is demonstrated somewhere, then the, the learning outcomes from that are transferable to other countries, which I think is, is this, that is really, really positive and should be encouraged. So um, I, I want to say the, the presentation on the waters and coast of Africa clearly demonstrate that the good example from national can be transferred to uh, sub-regional and there is still the potential to go continent-wide and uh, this is a demonstration that we need to pay more attention to the importance of air observations as especially in Africa that governments want to see the maps, they believe the maps because from the maps they can have some transparency and understanding what is on the ground in order to know how to allocate resources equitably. So on behalf of all the people who have already acknowledged, who have contributed to, uh, to this presentation, and my, and my co-chair, uh, Kamal Labaski, I wish to thank all of you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Ramos, for your very interesting presentation um, that demonstrated powerful examples on the use of Earth observation data to monitor water and coasts in Africa and how the information provided by Earth observation data is fundamental in helping communities, industry, and governments to better understand Africans' changing landscape and natural resources which results in improved knowledge and better decision-making across the continent. In particular, it was very interesting, the example from Kenya, which is using Earth observation data together with other information, such as cropland and biophysical data, to monitor and identify flooded areas, affected crops and communities. And also, I would like to mention the example you provided on the water observation from space, uh, from Digital Earth Africa, which allows um, anyone to better understand water availability um, anywhere in Africa and how this initiative is crucial for African countries. So uh, thank you again for your very um, interesting and inspiring uh, presentation. So now, um, uh, at this point, I would like to, 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 to invite um, our pre presenters to turn on uh, their videos.
um, and we have concluded our uh, pre-recorded presentations. Uh, so, uh, and we, we, uh, the participants can see us um, if they present. Yeah, thank you, thank you, guys. So, and uh, I'm going to unmute your your. Okay, uh, so um, we had um, we have some questions in Slido and. Um, the first question I would like to pose, and I suppose it's for the entire panel, um, how best can collaborations amongst researchers in the field of coastal environments and sustainability, sustainability uh, be formed, especially those from Africa? Um, I don't know um, who would like to start with this, maybe Amos? Oh, I muted my mic. Can you all hear me now? Yes, yes. Hello. Good. So the, the, the question is really, really important. And being an African and being practicing in Africa for quite some time, I think that has always been the challenge. How do we sustain very good initiatives with very good outcomes over a long time? I think the way forward right now is to, as we mentioned in other things, to co-design from the start is very, very important. And also beginning to see research institutions as a critical a critical pillar in any project that we try to apply in terms of uh, air observations. I think this is really important because if we take the case of Ghana and other African, uh, other African countries, if an, an EO project is implemented, there has to be a way that there's a buy-in in one way or the other from the research institutions. And after the project is ended, in one way or the other, postgraduate students can continue to use these, some, of, some of these tools, bring out new products, and at the end, the government can take that. So I think the role of the research institutions is really key to start and throughout the, the phases of the project. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else would like to? Look, I guess I can comment to some extent on our sort of proposed experience with D-Africa um, and how we see that as being, I guess, a vehicle to, I guess, in the same model, and you're aware of this, Andrea, I guess, um, to enable researchers and, and government institutions and that to take something from a research basis through to an operational um, an operational functionality um, and kind of break down those barriers um, in terms of earth observation data. Um, I mean, we're just we're starting to look, as you said, um, to move some of our functionality and some of the things we developed in Australia to DE Africa. Um, but that's that's the Australian government taking a, a functionality over there. In the long term, I'd imagine we'd really want um, the buy-in from the the local the local um, governments, the in country and the researchers to to take those kind of pilots that we enable over there and, and take the learnings from them to, to to sort of take ownership of them and move forward with them. Um. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else would you like to comment on, on the question? No? So, um, so I suppose we move to the next one, um, which is for uh, Leah Segi. What is uh, the current status of UN Environment and IBM Marine Litter Digital Platform? Uh, thanks for that question. Um, so currently IBM is working on a version one of the platform and it's initially to be released this year, um, so we'll see. Uh, right now they're working on a dashboard to show baseline information about how much marine litter exists in each country and what the largest sources of marine litter are. Um, this particular model that they're working with is in collaboration with Ann Bowser from the Wilson Center through Earth Challenge 2020. Um, and she is using citizen science data from beach cleaning efforts um, to inform this model. And so right now the current challenge is how do we integrate information from count data from beach cleaning efforts with 
um, photo identifications of beach litter. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. So our next question uh, is um, to, to Stephen Gregg. From, from a work program perspective, how do you see the Knowledge Hub helping with some of the actions you, you have aligned in your presentation? Thank you. Thanks for that question. I would say it's interesting because this conversation just came up yesterday at a staff meeting in which we, AquaWatch, has a number of activities that are currently going on. Um, for example, um, putting together a, a catalog of, of algorithm approaches, um, um, putting together the data sets, um, putting together applications that are out there, um, so, you know, some of the different tools. And all these could be seen you know, in some way as, as a spoke in the knowledge hub. Um, and so, again, I think AquaWatch, um, you know, our focus is water quality, and we're, we're, we're looking at those various components. Um, and I, I would say these all would, um, you know, eventually feed into um, the construction of, of, of the knowledge hub, you know, be it the Geo Knowledge Hub or AquaWatch, you know, having some kind of satellite knowledge hub um, you know, we've been working on. So there has been a, a group within AquaWatch which has um, been um, talking about the, the knowledge hub and the architecture or how um, this would uh, be put together. I think one of the issues with uh, the knowledge hub, and I know it's been talked about at some past GEO meetings, is again, understanding the end user needs and uh, the different needs from the community. I think, um, you know, as some of my colleagues like to use the food analogy, there's some people that just want uh, the best the ingredients and they want to make, you know, make the, the dish themselves. There's other people that uh, want you to do all the cooking. They, they want, they just want the finished product. Um, and so, you know, in the, in the water quality community, there could be research scientists that, um, you know, want to work on, um, you know, some specific issue and want to design their own algorithms. There's other, there's water quality managers. I mean, they have busy lives. They don't want, they don't want to have to deal with uh, analysis ready data or what version, or what algorithm people are using. Uh, just give them a number. Um, so that's that's just something that um, we need to be cognizant of uh, moving forward as as we're designing and envisioning the, the knowledge hub from the water quality perspective. Thank you, Stephen. So now I go to to our uh, other Stephen. Um, how do we deal with artifacts such as clouds in Earth observation imagery when deriving coastlines? Thanks, Andrea. Um, I guess there's, there's two methods that, that we sort of utilise, and um, one ties very closely into that uh, analysis-ready data um, sphere in terms of taking down those barriers for people to use the data before they need to do this type of analysis. So talking about things like cloud masking and pixel quality type of, of things. Um, but those things aren't perfect by any means. Across different data sets, they're more effective um, or, le or less effective. For instance, with Sentinel-2 data, it's much more difficult to, to implement these kind of cloud masking algorithms. The real crux of what we found with a lot of our work to get clean products out is to utilise that time series. And a lot of the products we do in the coastal space um, utilise as medians and, and, and bulk time series analysis. And this is not only effective in getting rid of things like cloud or, or, or more effectively residual clouds, so things that aren't picked up by, by traditional cloud masks, uh, but also things like um, white caps or breaking water, you can really start to mitigate against those effects. So we found it very powerful, the, the ability to have that standardised ARD and utilise a, a full archive of data. Thank you. Um... So um, my next question is to Amos, and um, how do you see methodologies developed in some countries in Africa being transferred to other locations and stakeholders 
For instance, the methodology created in uh, Google Earth uh, Engine platform in Kenya uh, to identify flooded areas being used in a different uh, country in Africa. And in your uh, opinion, um, what role did a geo uh, knowledge hub can play on this uh, technology and methodology transfer? Um, can you please, Amos, uh, unmute your microphone? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So for the question, uh, I think within GEO already there is a mechanism and the mechanism for ensuring that uh, other African countries, for example, get to know about the good methodologies and examples from other countries is through the regional GEO. So uh, in Africa, we have the Afri GEO, which is currently hosted by the Regional Center for Mapping for Resources for Development. So through the Afri GEO, African countries meet every year to discuss the various methods that have been developed. And I'm very hopeful that with the Google Engine project, which was implemented by Kenya, uh, when we have that forum, that African-based forum, uh, I know that some other, other African countries will buy into that. But the other thing is, once the results are also published, what happens is that you also have other African countries going to the GEO website and create, try to network with other organizations who have already done this. And I think this is really, really, really good, very, very good. Now, the issue of how, how, how does a knowledge hub uh, help in the process? Uh, I think, again, through the regional geo, which is the African geo, this can be achievable, that uh, African countries can learn uh, within the regional geo to see how the knowledge hub would be useful for some demonstrating other projects. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so my next question goes to uh, Leah. Um, it's, uh, is there a timeline in place for the Geo Blue Planet initiative to start engaging with users if it hasn't uh, started yet? Um, to co-design wave force products that are fit for purpose? And who are the key uh, users and stakeholders that will be involved and in how the initiative envisaged to do that? Thanks for that question. Um, so Waveforce users are already involved in the project. And this includes countries from SPC or the Secretariat of Pacific Community, and that consists of 22 island countries and territories. The rollout is expected to take five years, and it depends on when we receive funding for this project. Um, and the project does have a heavy focus on regular user engagement um, through workshops and consultations and trainings, because we can create a tool, but the tool's not helpful if no one uses it. So we do have a strong emphasis of really focusing on co-design and making sure that this tool really is fit for purpose. Thank you. Um, I think I'm having some problems with my mic. Okay. Um, so my next question uh, goes to um, Stephen Grab. And um, is there uh, any plans to put or host the AquaWatch inventory, uh, the global data sets, uh, both uh, in situ and satellite remote sensing data in the cloud? Um, thanks for that question. So I think it was the <clears throat> second activity I talked about um, today um, where we are putting together or stitching together the, these data sets, be it um, the, the satellite Earth observation data and the in situ data, all these different uh, disparate data sets, um, putting them together and overlaying them um, <clears throat> at the on the platform that's, that's held here at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. So that effort actually will, the project, um, hopefully will be announced um, tomorrow. Um, 
the final decisions are made and whether to move forward with it, <clears throat> uh, at which time there'll be more information coming out. But that that um, platform, again, which is bringing together all these different data sets of the inventory that uh, we've compiled, um, will be seamlessly put on the AquaWatch uh, website. So again, we're not generating data, but we're pulling data sets together. You know, we're we're linking those data sets, um, and some of these, and of course, a lot of these data sets are on the cloud currently. So um, this 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 platform will be um, displayed on the AquaWatch website. Um, you, you won't see what's going on behind the scenes, um, but it'll be interactive and it will be updated daily. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for for your answer. So um, I have uh, one question to to Stephen Sega. Um, and um, can uh, the the types of products that are generated by Digital Earth Africa um, help assess climate change effects such as sea level rise? Yeah, it's it's an interesting question because it gets. I mean. The issue of coastal change that's correlated with sea level rise, obviously that's a lot of people's first response. Um, so I think it's important to understand with some of these products that they have to be interpreted, I guess, holistically and looking at all the different effects that um, these kind of things that can impact the coast, be it anthropogenic, um, being at different kind of extreme events. Um, one of the things we are trying to do is to try and link things, I guess, more broadly to climate drivers. So to try and look at more extreme events and see whether there are patterns of erosion that are are being that are more closely correlated with with different kind of climate drivers. Um, so I, I would, um, I guess, put a degree of caution into interpretation that when the when the coastline change is interpreted, that people people really have to look at their individual situation, the country, the the area that they're looking at, and and look at the multiple drivers that are going to be causing that. Thank you, thank you, Stephen. Uh, we are approaching to our time uh, for you, Stephen. One o'clock. Uh, morning. Um, so I would like to suggest we close our session now as we have uh, almost reached 90 minutes time. So this Slido uh, channel will remain open for the next 48 hours. Uh, so um, you can, the, our participants can uh, still post uh, questions in the Slido channel. Um, we will collect all unanswered questions, as I mentioned before, and the panel will do their best to, to answer them within uh, the next week. Also, the live session has been recorded, and it will be available uh, on the GEOS website together with the transcript of all the questions and answers. And um, I would like to, to invite all uh, uh, the participants of our last GEO, um Symposium uh, for our last Geo Symposium Day that's going to be tomorrow, and we are going to have three uh, sessions. Um, the first one is monitoring essential variables. Uh, second one is the resource mobilization and sustainable funding, and the closing session. And finally, um, on behalf of all our presenters, uh, on behalf of my co-facilitators, Kerry, Soya, and Kathy Fontaine, and on behalf of the GEO Symposium Working Group, I would like to thank you for joining us today. So thank you again, and until next time.